there are no prescribed emotions. The first thing I want to talk about is the topic of stabbings and jabbings. I want to revisit that because I'm not sure in the past I've described them accurately as to what they are. I've suggested in the past that the cabal in my head, the people that wish me harm and are always trying to put emotions into my head, I've suggested that they can use emotions directly as opposed to just suggesting them. And the more I think about it and the more I feel it, I feel as though they don't really have that power. I feel as though I've given them more power, I've attributed more power to them than they deserve. My mom and her dad both are plagued, were plagued, are plagued by middle of the night stabbings and jabbings of anxiety. And I think that the main way these come are in suggestions as to the thoughts we ought to be thinking and then suggestions as to how we should feel about those. And I've said in the past that it isn't easy to keep thoughts out of our heads, but it isn't necessarily difficult to choose how we feel about those thoughts. So if they suggest to us in the middle of the night that we ought to think about our children and worry about them, we can think about our children, but we don't have to worry about them. If something's coming up at work, then they can suggest if they can get us to wake up, and I think they do tricks on us, like in the movie Inside Out, to make us wake up so that they can start pestering us. I wouldn't put it past them. And once we're awake, once the train of consciousness has left the station, I think it's okay, you know, depending on how I deal with it, to have thoughts pop into my head. I don't even if they're not my thoughts. I, I kind of wish that that wouldn't happen, but it isn't important as long as I can figure out how I feel about it. What kills my mom especially is worry. So a thought will pop into her head, often a dreadful thought, and then it will be patently obvious what the voices in her head are suggesting as to how she should feel about it. So these emotions are there, available, but I think we have to choose to allow them. And in the past I thought maybe they could just feed us emotions wholesale without, our, without any choice. And I said that was probably against the rules. And the more I think about it, the more I believe that in a universe that is rooting for us, even though it's not a codependent universe, in such a universe, it is against the rules for them to just force us to feel emotions against our will. The more powerful I get in combating the emotions that they suggest to me, the more obvious it becomes that I really do have the power to choose which emotions I allow and which I don't allow. It's still a daunting task. If somebody's suggesting that you eat chocolate cream pie and they keep suggesting it over and over and over, that's not easy. But the truth is you have the power not to eat the pie. You may feel as though you don't, but when it comes right down to it, you can choose not to eat pie. And that's how I feel about the emotions. It's powerful when someone suggests something over and over. And there are lots of emotions 
that our culture tells us that we ought to feel. If we're mourning the loss of someone close to us, our culture tells us that we should be mourning. And some helpful people will say, don't suppress your emotions. Let them come out. Don't be afraid to feel those emotions. And they're assuming, they're almost prescribing emotions that you're supposed to feel in that situation. And I don't think their advice is necessarily bad if those are the emotions that you naturally are feeling. But what options you have come down to what you decide. Yes, you should probably avoid suppressing emotions, but what if you just don't want to feel the emotions that everyone tells you you ought to feel? Don't suppress anything, but choose what you want to feel, even if it's inappropriate, even if it feels like everyone else would look down on you for it. You can choose to be miserable in a happy situation, obviously, a lot of people do, and conversely, you can choose to be happy in what everyone else would tell you should be a miserable situation. And when you get that figured out, you have limitless power over seen and unseen forces that are trying to get you to feel a certain way so that they can control you. Once you figure that out, I can be happy at a funeral if I want to be. I can be happy if I lose one of my own children. That's a parent's biggest fear often. And that's a prescription. I just said that's a parent's biggest fear as though, of course, that's the way it should be. And a parent should go around afraid all the time that they might lose their children, that their children might die before they do. That's a very commonly held fear that I've heard other people express. But what if your child is happy when she or he checks out? What if they've lived a good life and that you and they are at peace with each other and you see that maybe being somewhere else is better for them than being here? That can comfort us with older people when they leave, but I don't see why we can't be happy when death happens. We're told the opposite, but death can be a very good thing, a welcome thing. And that's just one example. We don't have to feel threatened if our partner, our sexual partner, or partners look around and desire other people. That could be a really great thing. We don't have to automatically feel threatened by anything that seems to be prescribed for us to feel. And when the voices in our heads, my head in particular, start to be relentless about something, eat the chocolate green pie, eat it, you know you want it. It's often about those kinds of emotions when I say to myself, hey, you know, I really don't need it. And it isn't my idea in the first place. So get the fuck out of my head. And when I rebuke them and I say, you know, I don't I don't want to feel that way. I don't choose to and I don't have to. They give up. They they pretty quickly give up. I've noticed this a lot in the last few weeks. It really works for me. I'm just saying. And I'm not prescribing anything for you. That's a tricky topic, and I've talked about it before. I'm not blaming any victims or shaming them, but I'm saying that this does work for me. It might work for you, and if you feel like it, give it a try. asphalt. They paid someone to haul asphalt. And 
another helpful tip if your voices in your head are like mine and anecdotally I know a lot of people who have said that their voices are often torpedoing them with anxious thoughts in the middle of the night so I know I'm not the only one who has such voices sometimes my voices will say to me that I should think about things that have caused me anxiety in the past they'll put they'll rewind different events and then what they're hoping is that I will go through those events again in my mind with the same emotions that were attached to them the first time. But we don't have to do that. We don't have to attach the same emotions. We can have any emotions we want. So if we have leveled up since that event happened in any way, we can replay it with us as the hero in the story or we can replay it and the person that caused us distress looks so much punier now than they did before or the situation itself is punier in terms of our relative strength if you're able to replay the memories and laugh it's like the Harry Potter ridiculous spell when you when you look at a bogart and you laugh at the bogart because it's not scary anymore that is the key when your voices dredge up old painful scary memories you're not the same person you were so you just wave your wand and you say ridiculous 